This podcast is intended to provide information for educational purposes only and to serve as a starting point for you to have a conversation with your personal physician. Nothing stated on this podcast should be considered medical advice. Consult with your physician before undertaking or changing any treatment plan. All right. Welcome to episode 18 of the Pound of Cure Weight Loss Podcast. Yes. Every- you get a Zenbeck. You get a Zempic. Everybody gets a Zempic. <laughs> Did you watch last night, Oprah? Absolutely. I would never have missed it. Yeah, that was a really great special. I, I thought she did a fantastic job. You know, first of all, Oprah and I go way back. I mean, back when I was in high school, I would come home and, and like 4 p.m., I'd watch the Oprah show. Mm-hmm. And I just always loved her. She just was always so human, you know? Mm-hmm. There was something on that that really stuck with me when she showed that the tv guide and it said that she was lumpy, lumpy dumpy, dumpy and, and downright something frumpy yeah, yeah. Lumpy, oh my gosh frumpy. and and that was from 1990 and so here she is 35 years later bringing that up i assure you that she didn't have to go searching through that she knew exactly who wrote it mm. exactly where it was and it just really shows how how hurtful some of these statements can be how hurtful obesity bias is well, and Oprah Winfrey being such an incredible woman and so... So accomplished. Accomplished. Yeah. And the thing that makes the headlines over and over again is yes. about her weight struggles. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. I love that show. I There was so much good stuff. They talked yeah. about Set Point. Mm-hmm. They, I thought they gave they did a pretty good job yeah. with the medications. They really kind of sold the medications. And, and I think, of course, they picked people who had been very successful. And, and we see, you know, 15, 20% of people really not able to do it. They didn't, I don't, also don't, didn't think that she talked enough about the access and the cost. Well, I, I was really excited that they had the VPs of Eli Lilly and yeah. Nova Nordisk on yeah. there. And I was like, oh, we're going to get good. But it was so, I was so disappointed. It was so vanilla like yeah. oh we're just committed to obesity and making billions of dollars yeah. really but billions of dollars is first and you know obesity after that yeah. if it makes the billions we're in i thought that was kind of how they they needed it. to be up on the stage being hounded much more than they were right like you have this life-saving treatment what are you doing how are you going to serve the public this is like the polio vaccine to some degree mm-hmm. and so you know there's some moral obligation to provide these medications and not necessarily look at them solely as a vehicle for profit. So anyway, that leads very, very smoothly, coincidentally, into our In the News segment. And so our our In the News segment, it comes off of Yahoo, and it's about Oprah revealing the real reason why she sold her Weight Watchers, her shares. So Oprah owns 10% of Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers a while ago brought um, bought Sequence Health, which is a telemedicine company that prescribes Ozempic, Wegovy, Monjaro. And so Oprah's been on the board for Weight Watchers for I think about a decade now and, and uh, owns a significant percentage. And she, don't, she actually didn't sell them. She donated yeah. them to the Smithsonian Museum for African American Studies uh, and African American History. And and I, first of all, I love that she did that. She's like, like, I'm yeah. not making any money for yes. doing this. And but I what I really love about that is that she, you know, Oprah at her root, she started as a local news journalist. And I think one thing she's always done so well is she tells the honest, unbiased story. And she did that really, really well last night in this in this episode uh, that she put out. And I think by her, you know, making a major financial shift in her life just so that she could tell the story and could not be criticized for her bias. I really respect did that. And I think we've talked so much about how much bias there is in the insurance industry, in the pharma industry. And and it's so nice to see someone really taking a stand and saying, hey, I'm going to present the most unbiased version of this thing that I can. So it was. it's a great news segment and a, and a great special. And I really urge any of you out there who missed it to, to watch it. You're going to hear about set point. You'll hear about the meds. You'll, you'll, um, you know, they have some national leaders in the field as well. Um, and you see the pharma industry kind of, uh, you know, say whatever their PR people told them to say. Yeah. Hey, well, exactly. <laughs> she didn't, did you notice how she didn't even answer Oprah's question? No. 
Did you notice we had to switch spots? <laughs> yes, we did. We're sitting on it. For those of you listening, you won't have noticed. <laughs> right. But if you're watching, we did switch spots. So our our, our uh, guy who helps us with the video says we should we should switch. So here we are on different sides. It's it's a little awkward. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, shift changing up what we're used to. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So let's move on to our patient story. We've got Bev here. Bev is really an amazing patient. She's been so successful yeah. and has just been driven and determined to make these changes in her life. And what I've loved is she's really made them kind of step by step by meaningful step. And we're going to help her make that final step, final uh, last step today. So um, anyway, let's welcome Bev. Yep. Well, we have Bev here. I'm super excited to have Bev share her story today. Bev, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. We're really happy to have you. Why don't you just start off by sharing with the listeners a little bit about your story and your background? Yeah. Um, well, I had surgery in October 31st of 2022. Everybody thought I was crazy for having it on Halloween. I'm like, no, I just no waited. Candy for me. I waited 10 months. I want it. So just get it as soon as I could. And, you know, just going back, I'm not a unique bariatric patient, right? I wasn't obese as a child, but when I hit puberty and I hit puberty pretty early, like 11 years old, dieting seemed like a rite of passage then. And, you know, I compared myself to my peers and they were all thin little girls mm -hmm. and I was getting curves. And so that meant I needed to diet. And I didn't even realize until the last few years that I actually, that behavior broke something in my metabolism. Yeah. I think, so. you know, dieting calorie restriction, especially when it's kind of this crazy crash diet or these extreme diets at a young age, it can be really damaging. You know, our metabolism it starts, so the backbone of it kind of starts when we're in utero, um, mm -hmm. but it really is, you know, well into adolescence and puberty and almost your very young adult years that your body kind of settles on, hey, am I, you know, am I a fat storage body or am I a fat burning body? And so I think, you know, you really have to be careful with children and the types of diets you put them on. Yeah. My first diet was the AIDS candies, age 11. The yep. candy diet? Yeah. They were like little chocolate or caramel candies that, and the secret was you drink it with a cup of hot water. <laughs> Just get rid of the candy and have the hot water before your meal. But, and so yeah. you ate that before your a meal? meal. Mm -hmm. Was it a laxative? Uh, I don't recall that <laughs> side effect. Maybe. Yeah, that sounds but, <laughs> I, I'd worry about that. But right? that was like the first one. And then it was Weight Watchers and Tops and the Atkins diet yeah. and all these, you know, that never stuck. So, so how old were you when you had surgery? Um, 64. 64. Yeah. I'm going to be 66 next month. So let's talk about that decision. You were, you're, you're a nurse. Yeah. And so you kind of spent your whole life as a nurse. When did you first start to think about bariatric surgery? Um, I, I actually, when I hit 60, hmm. I couldn't lose any more weight. Yeah. And menopause, you know, just after menopause. That, yeah. I think the pandemic, there was all, you know, and then I started having all this ridiculous pain. So I lost a job that I couldn't do anymore because I couldn't hardly walk or stand. Oh, jeez. And, you know, was that the, obviously, my illness of obesity. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Yeah. But what a turnaround. Yeah. So, so how did you decide on the surgery that you, you ended up having? Uh, the gastric bypass. I kind of, when I met with you, you had that little wonderful quiz and I knew I weighed 295 pounds at my high Wow! and I'm five foot, not, I mean, I'm losing inches. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't want to lose inches up this way, but um, yeah. So five foot four. So yeah, it was, uh, yeah. I said, I want to take off the most I can take off. Yeah. Okay. So you chose the, the little bit more aggressive route. Yeah. Um, and what was your experience like after surgery? It was beautiful, yeah. even in the hospital. Now, going into surgery, I like I could hardly walk across the street, yeah. and I couldn't really walk limited. without pain. Yeah. I was on a cane. I had I walked with a cane. And I remember oh. you giving me kind of the the rundown of, you know, what I could, you know, lose and everything. And you're like, that cane could be a problem. I go, I'm going to do it. I'm a determined person. But yeah, you're, you, this surgery, I could have done it without it. But, you know, there's a lot to do to get there. And I think I did a lot of the right things yeah. with you. 
And you did a lot of the right things afterwards yeah. as well. I know that we talked all the time. Oh, we did. You were like a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Registered dietitian. So he's part, part dietitian, part therapist. I almost said nutritionist. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, don't say that. That's a bad word around part here. Part dietitian, part, <laughs> part therapist. Yeah. Yeah, you're... Um, you're like an old soul and a young body because you're bright. You're bright. Thank you, Bev. What, but why don't you tell us a little bit about some of that turnaround you made with your nutrition choices and maybe your movement, if that has changed a lot oh, when yeah. you've been able to do since surgery? Well, you know, I'll start off with the movement from surgery. You know, I got out of bed and I could walk. And I wasn't even using the cane. And I'm kind of like blown away. I'm trying to like, how does that happen in like an overnight scenario? And I thought maybe it had something to do with the diet you put me on prior to surgery. To... Or maybe the surgery itself. Really? Yeah. So, you know, weight loss is a very anti-inflammatory state. Obesity, weight gain is an inflammatory state. And when you're in the process of losing weight, that actually reduces the amount of inflammation. And so a combination of the pre-op diet you did, and then the surgery where we really start to see these hormonal changes within hours after surgery may have started to decrease the inflammation, your systemic inflammation in your joints. Isn't that, that's like mind-blowing miraculous yeah. to be able to move like that and not having been able to to do that. So that piece of it, the movement, uh, from the get-go, I was walking maybe 10 minutes, four times a day. And then I got up to walking like an hour a day. Wow. So I And think... you could barely cross the street before surgery. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's another really important lesson there is mobility. You know, as you age, and, and I don't remember you really having a lot of medical illnesses. Did you have a lot of no. medical illnesses I mean, going into surgery? I, people would ask, um, do you have diabetes? I'm like, not yet. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because I knew it was all coming, but my cholesterol, no high blood pressure yeah. was crazy. And so on one hand, all your numbers, all your blood work looked great. But on the other hand, you know, it just took five Quality. seconds to watch you try to walk across the street to realize that there were some health issues. And so as you age, the number one determinant of how that, that process goes is mobility, even more than metabolic health and everything like that. It's your mobility really drives your health as you get older. And, and if you can maintain your walking well into your 80s, that generally um, is, a, is a much easier aging process than people who are struggling in their 60s. And so let's talk about your mobility. I mean, it sounds like it's changed dramatically since. Early. Yeah, yeah, it really has. I, I go, I, my primary is at El Rio here in town. Okay. I want to get you guys together because you guys have been, you saved my life. El Rio does a lot of really good things. They do. Yeah. They have exercise classes that yeah. are free to all their patients. And that's where I started. Yeah. So they have like the strength, you know, training. And I know from meeting with you and everything that that's really important to build the muscle. And, uh. So starting there, I could, <laughs> yeah, I right. See it. I see that muscle. Yeah. <laughs> My next thing is, I'm like, I, I want to find out how to get that surgery to get rid of this that the muscle <laughs> won't, you know. But anyway, we'll leave that for another time. But yeah, um, so I started those classes, and I would have to position myself close to a counter so I could get up off of the floor. And now I can just get up off of the floor. Yeah, yeah. How far can you walk? Um, I well, let me tell you. <laughs> We were just, I have taken so many vacations since October. Oh, good for you. Estes Park, nothing but walking, yeah. like hours of walking. Um, we went to, we've been camping down in um, Patagonia with RV. Now RVs, you know, that's, 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 a lot of that's work. work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get up in the RV, do all your stuff, get down below, do all your Pack stuff. It all. So, yeah, and we got dogs, so we're just, you know, taking a lot of walks with the dogs. So active. Yeah. It was a gift. So, Completely different lifestyle. Totally. What, what was your, your starting weight? You said it was 295. Yeah. And we predicted, I think, around 90 pounds for you. Yeah, I think you told me like 195 or something. 195 with I'm, 100 I'm like, pounds of weight loss? Yeah, I'm like, I'm not liking I'm, that. I'm yeah. going to go long. So what'd you get to? I weighed before I came today. Okay. I thought, he's going to ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I have my shoes and everything <laughs> on. and I'm yeah, looking, I, I, I don't weigh either. I just yeah. don't. Don't even do it. reasonable, yeah. But with everything on, I was 166. <gasps> Get oh out, God. right? Wow. Is that crazy? So you lost 130 pounds. Yeah. And we predicted maybe 100 max. Yeah. So you knocked it out of the woods. Yeah. It was an exciting journey. Yeah. Do you feel like it's difficult to maintain this current weight? No. I mean, I'm surprised every day. Yeah. 
I, I really am. Last night, and, and it's changed what I eat too, right? I mean, I I crave fruits now and nuts. I carry. I was like putting my cell phone away. I don't know if you saw, but I have my cashew stuff down in there because the emergency nut. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the emergency nut. I learned nuts. well. <laughs> <laughs> So um, and I made calabacitas last night, you okay, know. Okay, yeah, so, that's a great dish. So, yeah, just kind of still figuring out. I do a lot of uh, beans and legumes. Mm -hmm. When we went camping, my husband's still, I got to have a hot dog, got to have a hamburger. <laughs> I'm like, that's okay. I'm making my taco soup with all my beans and legumes and, you know. Yeah. So so let's kind of talk about your, your set point. And I think you, you oh, yeah. from the very beginning, that really, that idea really resonated with you that, that your body weight was kind of stuck at 295 pounds. And that's really where this idea of, of the disease of obesity, there are some people who, if they just clean up their eating and start exercising, the weight comes off and their, their body isn't set at that number. It's, it's more fluid. Mm. Um, there's other people where no matter what they do, they cannot lose weight. When you were 295 pounds, were you able to lose weight? No. Not a pound. No. Five pounds in the, with Maybe. the maximal effort. My, my primary gave me Ozempic back then. Okay. Okay, so I had no instruction. Just, you know, I think this could help. It's been helping. So I go home, I take it. it made me so nauseated. Yeah. When I went back to see her a month later, she goes, how did the Ozempic go? Oh, I took it once. It made me, I had a side effect of being nauseated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She goes, try it again. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the, that happens at the beginning. Ideally, that can that'll go away with time. But you just were really struggling, and then and then we did the surgery, and you just you turned out to be kind of a super responder. You know, you're someone who just responded much better than we expected. So grateful for that. Yeah. Being my age and having gone, you know, God love you. You were so calm in the pre-op room. I'm like, well, you know, in case you have to do an open, he goes, I never have to do an open. <laughs> <laughs> the nurse in me, you know. Yeah. Um, so what are you working on now? Like what's, what are your goals? You've kind of, a, you, you're, you're kind of getting toward what we call the end of the honeymoon phase yeah. where it's the weight is just coming off and it's just kind of effortless to control your weight. And you're not losing any more weight now, correct? No, I've been pretty much stable. Yeah. These Our goal weight's not months. zero. So at some point yes. you gotta, you gotta stop losing can't lose weight. weight forever. Yeah. Can't lose weight forever. So, so now that you're kind of at the stable weight, what are you, what are you working on? What, what's, what are your goals? Two things. I really want to, you know, work with Zoe on the metabolic reset because that's a, you know, it's been in my mind. I know I, I want to do something that's going to keep me a little cornered in there, focused in there. And then back to the strength training. I've been doing so much traveling that, you know, I haven't really got to, you know, work on the bands and the weights and, yeah. and the whatnot. So got to get build the strength to lift those bins in the RV. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so what's holding you back on the metabolic reset diet? Oh, you know, I, in it, it said, you know, you can't have like cottage cheese and yogurt and that's a, those are proteins are pretty, I'm not really a meat person, you know, I'll do the, the beans for my one protein and then maybe fish or, you know, something, but then I really do depend on the cottage cheese and the yogurt. So that's the thing that's kind of kept me shying away from it. Well, and the thing is, is that you absolutely can have the Greek yogurt and in small amounts, cottage cheese is not going to make or break your success. Oh. And the main thing I want to think about is like, how can we find what works for you long term? I like to say the metabolic reset diet embodies both definitions of the diet. Yes, we have the two week reset diet version, but ultimately it's this gold standard that we're trying to work towards that it's just our diet. It's just how we eat. And that incorporates some tweaks and adjustments that's going to be different for you versus different for somebody else who is following the diet. How can we make the metabolic reset diet sustainable for you? And if that includes cottage cheese, perfect. Wow. See, that goes back to that that thing we've talked about before with the black and white thinking. Yes. You know, I see it on paper and it's like, oh yeah, I can't do that. So not thinking there's yeah. other things. So so I'll, I plan to see you in yes, the nutrition do. program, maybe on a one-on-one -on -one soon. <laughs> I think that's a great point. I mean, I will always be with you guys. You have, And been... we will always be with you. That's the deal we make. Once once we do your surgery, you're our patient for life. I'm, I'm grateful because it's given me my life back. Honestly, I thought two years ago I wouldn't make it to see 70. Huh. Now I'm like 80. Here I come. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now you're like 70. I want to take a big trip for my 70th <laughs> birthday, yeah. right? I'm already talking. I'm like, okay, family, get ready. We're going to Greece. Oh, wow. And I'm your adopted daughter, so I'm yes. coming with you. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> All right. Well, that's fantastic. Bev, anything else you want to talk about or anything else, Zoe? Just, I'm just so proud of you. Well, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for you guys and your support. And oh, it's a good, great practice. Well, thank you. We appreciate yeah. that. We appreciate you being in part of our nutrition program, one of our patients. We're proud of all your success. I think it's been fantastic. And we really appreciate you being here and being vulnerable and sharing your story. Absolutely. Well, that, that part's easy. And it's like, it's the good part. I'm going to celebrate. Heck yeah. I'm gone shopping to Chico's. <laughs> Got to get those pants to take Got, it. To that's, get. Right. that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, I just love Bev. Oh, she's we, the best. We've we, had a really special connection since the beginning. <laughs> yeah. We really have the best patients, don't we? Do. We, we really do. do. Yeah. We really are so lucky with the, with the patients that, yeah. that come to us and that we get to share their, their stories of success. Yeah. So um, moving on to our nutrition segment kind of goes aligned with what Bev was talking about, about having to make those more baby steps changes. So a lot of people are not reaching their goals. Do you want to know why I think? Tell me. Because they're too vague. Yeah. I want to eat healthier. I want to exercise more. I want to lose weight. I want to lose weight. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'm like, okay, great. But how? Yeah. Right? We need to take this vague kind of pipe dream goal and turn it into actionable steps. Yeah. Right? And so the, the acronym SMART, which is used in so many capacities. Yeah. I'm sure I, like so many people can remember using it in school and different things like that. So a SMART goal for whoever needs a refresher stands for specific, measurable, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So that's how we take a vague goal into something that you can actually take action on. And this is exactly what we do in our Smart Support Squad support group that I just added to the nutrition schedule. So basically in this group, we take those vague goals, create more actionable SMART goals so that our nutrition members can go and spend the week working on that goal and then come back, check in, have the accountability. But the key is that these SMART goals take into consideration that are, right? The realistic. Yeah. Because the whole point in sustainable habit change is to have a SMART goal that is actually realistic. Work on it, work on it, work on it, work on it until it is a habit. Right. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. And then we set a new goal and then we keep stacking those habits on top of each other. And that is something that I'm clearly very passionate about because we want to set our patients up and our listeners up for long-term success, not just to try to do all the crazy things all at once and then get frustrated and quit. Yeah. I think that that the, these vague goals to me aren't really goals. Mm -hmm. They're hopes, they're wishes, they're dreams. And and it's great. We all should have those things. Those are really important. But it's the it's the the smart goals, these mm -hmm. small measurable steps. That's how you achieve these dreams. Like no Olympic winner was like, I'm going to be an Olympic champion and then it just happened. Right. No, it was hours and hours working toward this thing, then the next thing, getting their time under 40 seconds, under 38 seconds, under you know, and keep moving and moving down and achieving more and more with with more determined work. And I think that's how nutrition works too. I kind of talk about like we're building a wall here and each smart goal is a brick in that wall. Mm -hmm. And hey, I'm going to fix this my my issue with artificial sweeteners and I'm going to work on that for a couple weeks and really dial that in mm -hmm. and maybe I can't give them all the way up today, but I'm going to go down to twice a week and then the next week I'm going to go down to once a week and eventually you kind of work them out of your diet and then hey, I'm working on adding the vegetables in and you build it up and you build it up and you get to that metabolic reset diet, you get to that really ideal optimal diet that you can sustain long term. And it's a very systematic and deliberate process. Mm -hmm. It's not this kind of, you know, simple, I'm going to do it and then you focus on it for, for a couple of days and you get there. Unfortunately, it takes a lot more work, but it is achievable. You can see it in, in Bev, you can see it in a lot of our patients. You can make these changes, but it takes work, it takes accountability, and it takes this deliberate approach to it. 
Right. And if you're watching on YouTube and you want that accountability to take that first step, comment what your SMART goal is. So if your vague goal is, I want to exercise more, turn that into a SMART goal of, I will go for a five minute walk after lunch every day during work and comment it on the YouTube. And we want to hold you accountable by he seeing those comments. Absolutely. All right. That was great. Yeah. Goal setting is so critical for, for this. And I think everybody focuses on, well, what should I be eating? But even before you focus on what you should be eating, you, you have to almost focus on the process. How am I going to get there? Yeah. So, so if you're looking for some help with SMART goals, anybody out there can join our nutrition program. It's on our website, poundofcureweightloss.com. And uh, it's not just limited to our patients, but if you're looking for some accountability uh, or some support in, in achieving your goals, then, then you know, we've got you there. Uh, so let's move into our economics of obesity segment. And, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about surgery. Our economics segment usually covers access to the GLP-1 medications, um, but we, we certainly see um, a lot of surgical patients in our practice. And, and I do a lot of revision surgery. The most common revision surgery I do is converting a sleeve to a gastric bypass for treatment of acid reflux. But we, we kind of take on everything in terms of, you know, surgery gone wrong. And we're not far from Mexico. So we, we see a little bit of that. Uh, we see patients struggling with abdominal pain or other issues, um, uh, often from a surgery that they've, they've um, had some some problems with. Uh, and so when it comes time to getting these surgeries approved, it can be tricky. And so there's a couple of issues we'll see. We'll see patients who don't even have coverage for bariatric surgery. And maybe that's why they went down to Mexico wow. in the first place. And and so that that sometimes can be an obstacle. And then and then we see really two main indications for having revision surgery. The most common thing that, that I do in my practice is for treatment of a problem, acid reflux, abdominal pain, ulcers, things along those lines. Um, but we also see patients who are hoping to, for, for additional weight loss. And the diagnosis really matters when it comes to insurance coverage. If you're trying to lose additional weight, that can be quite challenging. There's a lot of insurance policies out there that have what's called a once per lifetime clause, which means you can have one surgery the first time, but after that, if the goal is weight loss, no more additional surgery. Mm -hmm. I, I don't love that because I, I really think these decisions should be made between a doctor and a patient, but I get it because revision surgery is, you know, twice the risk and half the weight loss. Right. So, um, it so, shouldn't really be for that purpose. You know, th there's a lot of discussion about converting a sleeve to something called a SADI procedure or even a gastric bypass for additional weight loss. We've talked in the past, and we've had some patients who've had a sleeve revised to a gastric bypass and done really well with mm -hmm. weight loss. Mm -hmm. It's just not very reliable. And for me, when I'm doing a major surgery, I want reliable results. I don't want, I don't like yeah. doing a major surgery that works half the time. That's that's not great. Uh, I don't think anybody wants to sign up for that either. Um, so th that's my big issue. And even the SADI procedure, which is a more invasive invasive procedure than the than the gastric bypass and is uh, a little harder to live with, just more malabsorption, more malnutrition afterward. Um, the weight loss from that is modest, sometimes sometimes pretty good, sometimes not so not so good. 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds more than the gastric bypass, but still not not great weight loss. Probably not as much as we're seeing with the meds, to be mm. honest with you. Um, and so I think if you're looking at a revision for additional weight loss, I think you're gonna run into a lot of insurance problems. Um, and, and I think it's also really important that you have a really good understanding of how much weight you're expected to lose and what the range is, not just what the best person that you've, that the surgeon's ever seen is, but what's the range? What's the least they've ever seen after this procedure? That's a great question to ask as well. If we're looking at acid reflux, abdominal pain, ulcers, we can almost always get these things approved by the insurance company. It can be a little tricky, but in general, when we have a medic medical problem that we we can diagnose, we can prove with CAT scan, endoscopy, ultrasound, or some other imaging study, then we can typically get it approved. So it's all about that diagnosis and how you approach it when you're looking at revision surgery coverage. So let's say somebody is listening and maybe they're out of state or they did get their surgery in Mexico or something like that. Maybe they want a revision from a sleeve because they're experiencing heartburn or whatever it is. What would their, what would your recommendation be to them? Is there we can we can see them, right? We can see them for sure. So um yeah, we do see people from all over the country. So, I mean, yes, if, if someone is looking for revision surgery, we have one of the lowest complication rates in the country. We offer, I think, an unparalleled support program. Absolutely, you can come down to Tucson um, and, uh, and we can help you out with your procedure. All right, so Sierra, I think it's time for us to move into our, our questions from our users out there in social media land. Awesome. <laughs> 
Okay, so first question um, is from YouTube. What are my options for a post-sleeve weight gain? Will a revision work? After bariatric surgery, do you have to take vitamins forever? Okay, so let's first talk about a revision. I actually mentioned just that did. just a little bit <laughs> early. So the knee-jerk response for a surgical revision of a sleeve gastrectomy is either conversion to what's called a SADI procedure, which is where the intestine is divided just past the stomach. So right after the stomach where the small intestine joins, you divide the stomach and then you bring a loop of the fairly distal intestine up and you connect it like a loop. And it has, it's, its cousin is called the duodenal switch, which is instead of a loop, it's a divided Roux and Y anatomy. And honestly, the anatomic differences are not that critical. I think the important thing is, is that they're fairly malabsorptive procedures, where with a gastric bypass, we might bypass, say, the first third of the intestine. With this, you're bypassing two-thirds. With a duodenal switch, it could be 80 or 90 percent of the of the small intestine. And so that really has very different ramifications for patients. Um, and so my, my knee-jerk response for sleeve weight gain, and keep in mind, I'm a surgeon and I love doing revisions and complicated surgery, um, and yet I still think that the medications are a better option for patients. I think if a family member comes to me and is struggling with weight regain after a sleeve, I'm going to recommend the medications for them, which means I'm going to recommend the medications for my patients as well. I unless, think there's, what? Unless they have gastric reflux, right? Well, yes, unless they have gastric reflux, but in that's not in addition to. In addition, yeah. So that's a great point. Yeah. So if they have acid reflux and it, you know, not like oh, I pop a, a tums every now and then, but th I have pretty miserable acid reflux, then you're right. We would re we would recommend. Thank you. Good job. So yeah, then we would recommend a gastric bypass in that setting. Absolutely. And again, that that comes down to the safety and and also this idea that we're getting some benefit of the the surgery. Re reducing the reflux and also possibly some really good weight loss. Possibly not, in which case then we can bring the meds in. But yeah, when the when the goal is strictly weight loss, then then I would start with the meds. Right. Let's talk about the vitamins and and about the nutrition changes that you need to make for weight regain after a sleeve. Right. So do I have to take the vitamins forever? I when I'm preparing people for surgery, I like to say this is this is a lifelong commitment. Yeah. Right. Your anatomy is never going back to pre-surgery and neither is your absorption. And people who get gastric, uh, who get weight loss surgery are prone to developing deficiencies. I like to explain for two main reasons. One is yes, that, that altered anatomy results in an impaired absorption. The other piece of it is you're not eating the same volume or the same variety of food after surgery, at least for those first couple years. So yes, I like to mentally prepare patients that this is a lifelong commitment to take your vitamins, but those first two years are the most critical and ultimately working towards getting back to eating as much variety of fruits, vegetables, and whole foods to get those nutrients in as possible. Yeah, what about nutritionally? I mean, what are we doing nutritionally? for weight regain. Someone comes to you, they've regained weight after sleep, they don't have access to the meds, mm -hmm. they don't have reflux, they don't want a SADI procedure, they just want some help nutritionally, what should they do? Well, I promise you it's not go back to shakes to reset their pouch. <laughs> yes. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It's not, that's not the answer. The answer is not trying to fight against your body's hunger. Chances are, as you've regained weight, that natural hunger has increased. The volume of food you can tolerate increases. And I want you to eat more food. It's just a matter of eating more of the right thing. So I would 1000% recommend the metabolic reset diet as a way to really jumpstart that weight loss. And then from there, we can continue making nutrition changes. We actually do have the metabolic reset diet handout yeah. um, should be available soon. If it's not at the time of the listening, it'll be available very shortly after on our website. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's a great place to start if you're interested, but ultimately working towards eating as much whole, real, unprocessed food, lots of veggies, not limiting yourself in the volume of food that you're eating and not thinking you have to eat the same small amount as you did immediately after surgery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, great point, Zoe. 
But uh, let's move on to the next question, Sierra. Okay, this one is from the website from Mary. I'm trying to decide between sleeve and bypass, and my concern is that I have MS and take ibuprofen for pain. Not every day, and sometimes not even every week. Usually I take one tablet once daily for a couple of days. Would that make me ineligible for a bypass because of the risk for an ulcer? Yeah, so NSAIDs after a gastric bypass are really one of these, I think, fairly misunderstood um, um, concerns. And, and, you know, I think some patients, I've had patients say, you know, I get a headache, you know, once or twice a month, and I got to take some Advil for that. It's the only thing that works. So I don't want to have a gastric bypass. And, and I think with everything, you have to kind of weigh the risks. So what are the risks of taking NSAIDs that you can develop an ulcer? Do 100% of people who take NSAIDs get, a, get an ulcer after a gastric bypass surgery? No. No, they don't. And so this is even we're talking high dose NSAIDs. Mm-hmm. I, I'll see patients who had a gastric bypass 20 years ago and they show up and they're popping Advil like candy and they're they're not having any issues related to an ulcer. And, and sometimes we even do endoscopies and things like that and show there's nothing going on. So not 100% of people who take uh, NSAIDs will get an ulcer. So I think that's important to know that's where we're starting from. And then the second thing is dose matters with NSAIDs. If you take an Advil tablet once a week, that's very different than taking 800 milligrams of ibuprofen four times a day for that entire week. Mm-hmm. And so what, what this person's describing is fairly low use of, of NSAIDs. Um, the other question is, what's it for, right? If it's for aches and pains of your joints and you lose a bunch of weight, the weight loss is far more effective than the NSAIDs for reducing joint pain. And mm-hmm. so oftentimes that's a positive shift, even if you don't take the NSAIDs. Then, then you're still going to have less pain. And you can take Tylenol as well. And Tylenol, for a lot of things, isn't as effective. But I think this is something you'd have to talk to your surgeon about. Um, there is a little bit of wiggle room, though, with the NSAIDs. It's not, my recommendation is not just go for it and take as many NSAIDs as you like. I still tell patients, really avoid them as much as possible. But I think you got to live your life and understand that this is a spectrum. And, and if you can kind of position yourself on the lower risk side, most likely you're going to be fine. Just goes back to, it's not so black and white. It's not so black and white. That's why we have the podcast is because... we got to dig into the yeah, details. If, if we can answer all this stuff with a multiple choice uh, question, then then that would be, we wouldn't need the podcast. We'd need, you know, this, things are complicated. Obesity is complicated. Oprah said that in her show. She talked about how, what a complicated disease it is. And I, mm-hmm. and I you know, after 15 years, I, I still see that every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question is from Nick from the website. Are fruit juice concentrates fine if included in an ingredient list? Health halo alert. Yeah, right, exactly. (laughs) Fruit juice concentrates, when you see that in an ingredients list, I want you to think sugar. Um, And ultimately, that's just a way to add concentrated sweetness to whatever it is. So I'd still recommend, yeah, reading the ingredients list is great, but also looking at that nutrition facts and looking at the added sugar line and keep that as close to zero as possible. I think we should start the health halo game. Call it out, right? Every time you see it. Granola bars. There you go. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So, so we should be, if you're out there on social media and you see something that uh, that is a health halo, tag us. Tag us. Share it. Share it with us for sure. Yeah. Um, we love we love seeing them, and I think when you start to identify them and start to look for them, that's when you really start to understand how much the deck is stacked against us eating healthy. If you look at our current food chain, mm-hmm. so yeah, this is a total health halo, no question. I agree a hundred percent. This is just sugar. Yeah. yeah. You may as well replace it with cane sugar or coconut sugar. There's a health halo. I know organic. Yeah. Sugar. Organic sugar. There My you favorite. Go. <laughs> Just All kidding. right. Episode 18 in the books. Everyone gets Ozempic. We hope it was helpful. If you're out there looking for some nutritional support, you can always join our support group um, and reach out to us and in, in, through our social media channels if you have any questions that you'd like to see answered on the podcast. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>